The following is a paid program, and the views expressed on this show do not represent the views of WJZ AM, Intercom Communications, its sponsors, or affiliates. Get ready, Baltimore. It's time for some super slams and beatdowns. We've got the cheap shots and the clean finishes. Watch out for the chair. Oh, that's got to hurt. <laughs> this is Top of the Row. Your Monday night wrestling show on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Now, here's the enforcer, Baltimore's own, Kill Kuda Jr. Welcome to Top of the Row Wrestling Radio, ladies and gentlemen. I have quite the weekend to go over. I had to play some catch up today and yesterday because, you know, I had to do stuff over the weekend, like turn 29 and everything. So that was fun. But we got to start with New Japan because how could I not start with New Japan? New beginning in Osaka. But before I break this event down, I, I have to, I just feel like I need to tell this story is. Today, I watched, I finally got to see AEW Dynamite in its entirety. I am I need to change how I do this. I, I can't watch AEW Dynamite after a New Japan pay-per-view level event. I just can't, because very little will compare. That's the thing. If, if I watch New Japan before any, I can't watch any wrestling on the same day, because it will be, because I try to rate all of the matches and everything, I can't. I can't do it after New Japan because nothing will be as good. I still stand by it. I said it a year ago. I will hold on to it now. Right now, New Japan is the best in-ring product overall in professional wrestling. I will stand by that. So speaking of New Beginning in Osaka, quite the event they had. We started off uh, with the legends that are on their way out, which is the tradition over in New Japan, as Nakanishi teamed up with Tenzan, Kojima and Nagata, they took on the Unchained Gorilla, Togi Makabe, always one of my favorites, Honma, Toa Hanare, and the coach, Raisuke Taguchi, and Nakanishi got the win, which it doesn't really surprise me because it's not his last match. In New Japan, the tradition is in your last match, or in Liger's case, matches, you go out on your back. Not only do you lose, but you take the fall because you are passing the torch to who is next. Like how cool it was that Hiromu Takahashi got the final fall on Jushin Liger at the Tokyo Dome because he happened to be the current IWGP junior heavyweight champion, which is effectively a belt that Liger created. So it was very apropos that the current junior heavyweight champion be the one to pin him for the last time. So Nakanishi got a win here with his boys. I expect him to be in these eight-man type tag matches up until the end. He says he has four more to go. So whatever the last one is, is probably where he's going to take the fall. And that'll probably be, and that'll be it for him in New Japan. He, he didn't really cut a promo after this match. He just kind of thanked everybody for coming out about five times and then said, New Japan will only get bigger and better after I'm out of here. It, it, was, it was pretty cool. Very, very respectful about it. So they got that win. It was a 7 out of 10 match. The, the old boys got to do all their, you know, their signatures and stuff, and it was fun, but it just kind of did the job. That's all. Then we had the Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Championships where Sho and Yo came back with Rocky Romero, who had a makeshift flamethrower fire extinguisher thing on his way to the ring, which is kind of cool to see. And they took on Desperado, uh, El Desperado and... Yoshinibu Kanemaru from Suzuki Gun and Sho and Yo defended it was an 8 out of 10 match it was very it was a lot of fun to watch I'm glad they put the junior heavyweight titles on Sho and Yo because they're I'm not saying they're the only guys who can hold them El Desperado and Kanemaru have held them what five they've held them quite a few times but right now they're it they have a good look they the right amount of high impact high risk spots can still work in the ring very well well here's the plot twist and I'm curious if my super producer Hammer liked this as much as I did. Coach Taguchi came down <laughs> after the match <laughs> and suggested that he and Rocky Romero, as the mega coaches, as they call, as he referred to them, team up 
and challenge Sho and Yo for their titles. And Sho and Yo, based, they accepted that. So it looks like we're going to get that at some point. It looks like we're going to get Bryce K. Taguchi and Rocky Romero versus Sho and Yo. So the students versus the teacher for the belts. All right. Uh, I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that. Then we had another big-time tag match, eight-man tag match, where effectively the entirety of Bullet Club, that being the Gorillas of Destiny, Chase Owens, and Yujiro Takahashi, the Tokyo Pimps, they took on Hiroshi Tanahashi, Kota Ibushi, and Finn Juice. Hammer, that's my least favorite tag team in New Japan right now. I, I can't. I just I don't get it. I Because Juice is kind of, I get it, you know, eccentric. And then David Finley is just like, hey, man, I'm glad somebody hired me. Like, I mean, I'm not saying that he's not good because David Finley's a very good talent. It's just in that mix. It's like, dude, it's 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 Juice, who whether he's good or not, you can't help but notice the guy because of how he presents himself. And then Kota Ibushi, one of the best things going in New Japan. Hiroshi Tanahashi, arguably the greatest of all time in Japan. And then there's Dave. It's like three legends and their buddy Dave. Like, that's what it is. And that's fine. And they did get the win in this one. But more importantly, and this is my one of my favorite things about New Japan, I believe it was Tanahashi got the pin on Tamatonga. Now, Tamatonga and Tongaloa, the Gorillas of Destiny, are currently the IWGP heavyweight tag team champions. Ibushi and Tanahashi have been teaming up a lot recently, and they want a shot at that gold. Now, since Tanahashi pins Tamatonga, that means that technically they got a win over the tag team champions. The traditional rule of New Japan is if you beat the champ in a non-title match, you get a shot at their title. So I believe we're going to see that down the road. And Tanahashi and Ibushi versus G.O.D. is a fantastic idea. But here is my question. It's not that. It's what's next. Not for Tanahashi and Ibushi. They're two of the greatest of all time. You can put them anywhere and it'll work. I mean, what is next for G.O.D.? Because after that, can you really climb any higher in the tag team division after you beat or face Tanahashi and Ibushi? I don't know if you really can I'm curious. And of course, now it looks like that because Marty Skrull is in charge of Ring of Honor, that the door to a partnership between those two companies may very well be reopened. So I'm not, I'm not 100%. But that's my question. Look, it's going to be great. I'm excited for this build up and the match is going to be awesome whenever it happens. But after that, what do you do with, with G.O.D.? I'm curious. But anyway, that uh, the eight man, it was a seven and a half out of ten match. There were a couple spots I didn't really see coming, but it was kind of what you'd expect. No big deal. Then we had Okada and Osprey taking on Taichi and Zack Saber Jr., who has made quite the heel impact for himself. I have to say, look, he's still not over with me. I don't know why. It's going to take a lot for Zack Saber Jr. to get over with me personally. And Tai Chi is just a goof in the greatest way. And Miho Abe can take every cent that I have. But anyway, uh, I, I just, I, I enjoy the Suzuki Goon group because it is very much a business partnership. You know, they don't really take care of each other. They're just kind of like, hey, man, you're right. Like, that's kind of really it. While Bullet Club is a much more of a brotherhood type deal. And then Chaos is a family, man. Like, they get, they feel each other's pain. It's kind of crazy. Anyway, Okada and Osprey got the win. I gave this a seven and a half out of 10. You got to see a lot of trademark Okada stuff. And Will Osprey got to kind of do his thing a little bit. It was cool to see them tag. But, you know, I'll be honest. I want Will Ospreay going after singles gold. I want Okada in the world title picture, no matter how many times he does it. It is not a bad decision ever. And then, of course, the rumors came out recently that Triple H is on a personal mission to sign Okada to WWE, and everyone's going, oh, God, no. Now, here is my philosophy on this. I am with the majority of fans at the moment about this, okay? I, I do not think Okada should leave New Japan. I am totally with them on that. However, he's also a lot younger than you think he would be. I think he's, what, 32, which is just, uh, he's, 30, he's 30. Hammer told me, he's, that's it? When did he start in the pro scene when he was like nine? <laughs> that's insane, because that's the thing about Okada. He has done everything, and he's 30 years old. So that's why I don't think he's going anywhere. Give him five years. 
He'll do what they all do when they hit 34, 35. Hey, I'm going to take a schedule with less work days for a lot more money. I can come home when I want. If they get married and have kids, I can, I can still be a dad and a, and a husband and all that. And then they'll put me in big spots. Okay, cool. You know why? Now, I want it to happen a little bit sooner rather than later. You know why? Because it's still in my head that there's a possibility of Okada Cena, and I want it. So, other than that, I, I don't see it happening right. Okada's too young for this right now. He can do a lot in this. So, oh, he's 31. Either way, he's 31. But still, either way. That's insane. You would never think that guy's 31. You wouldn't look at him and Ibushi and think Ibushi is the older one. That's what's crazy about it. Because I think Ibushi's 34, I think. It's, just, it's, it, it's insane. So, to go back to the match, Okada and Osprey, it was a good match. Taichi, it was, it was kind of fun. Seven and a half out of ten. A couple things you didn't see coming. Nothing real crazy. Now let's get to the big ones. First, we have Sonata and Jay White, who is slowly becoming one of my favorite heels in the business because the guy's just great. He got a win. I love him and Gato as a pair. I think they do a great job with it. It was an eight and a half out of 10 match, Sonata and Jay White. They did incredible. They went 20 plus minutes. And it was, they didn't have to abandon each other's style to make this good. <laughs> You know, because normally in matches like this, there's that one moment where both wrestlers do something completely out of character for both of them. Just to, and everyone goes, oh, my goodness, didn't see that coming. Like, here's a kind of an odd comparison. But to try to make the point is the first time Sasha and Bailey faced off at TakeOver Brooklyn and Bailey did the Poison Rana off the top rope, which is something that neither of them do ever. Just things like that. Or Brock Lesnar trying a shooting star press on Kurt Angle at WrestleMania. Things like that. They never had to do that in this match. Sonata never had to break his his regular move set. Jay White never had to do anything different. And Jay White got a win for himself, which I think it's it's important to have Jay get wins like this. But it does bear the question about Sonata. He hasn't won a singles match since August of last year. That's a big deal. Like I mean, booking or not, I mean that's that's a long time, man. So I'm curious, what is, I don't know if this is a what does New Japan think of him, because they're still letting him do the cold skull gimmick, and he still looks great, and he still wrestles all these awesome matches. Having a great run in the tag team as part of LIJ, understood. But as far as the singles competitor, the guy hasn't won in a half a year. So I'm curious, especially with Jay White, who everyone always believes is one loss away from this catastrophic collapse that might lead to him re- reshuffling his character. And then it never happens. He gets a big win in an event like this, and he can kind of keep doing what he's been doing. So I'm, I'm curious about that. But they had an awesome match. Go, go back and watch it. Jay White and Sonata. I gave it an eight, uh, I gave it an eight and a half out of ten. You know what? I forgot to do this. Let me do this real quick. If you haven't heard my rating system before, I do it out of ten. A 7 out of 10 is just a good match that did the job. Okay? An 8 means there were some spots in there I didn't see coming. It was certainly better than expected. A 9 means it was a fantastic match that gave you everything you wanted and more. And I've only given one 10 out of 10 ever. Ever. And it was very recent. It was very recent. I gave a 10 out of 10 to DIY and Mustache Mountain at Worlds Collide. So I just think it's, it's, it was that good. So this is a 9 out of 10. No worries. This next one I'm going to talk about, which is, and please, please tell me you saw this one, Hammer. You saw the IWGP, the junior heavyweight. First of all, the first seven and a half minutes of this match <laughs> were just the, these two men attempting to cave each other's chests in with the most... You see, I refer to them as lucha chops because they just do these big overhand open palm slaps to each other's chests. And that was the first seven minutes of the match. They were just egging each other on. It was brutal, man. It was brutal. Here's how brutal it was. I'm using the word brutal for this and not what's later. And later, I'm going to talk about a segment where a guy got whipped, okay? It was it was brutal. So I give this a 9 out of 10. Because other than that, it was the perfect combination of Dragon Lee doing all of his high flying. Hiromu did his best to keep up. Man, these two are just incredible. The junior heavyweight division has never been in a better spot. And that's with Will Ospreay leaving it, more than likely. 
So they're in a great spot, and Takahashi is going to get a great chance to get over and really put put some shine on that title because it looks like we know who he's going to face next. I'll talk about that in a second. But these two did awesome, nine out of ten. I don't want to over describe this thing, but go back and watch it. Hiromu Takahashi versus Ryu Lee for the junior heavyweight title. Takahashi retained, but man, nine out of ten, great match. Then we had the one that we were all waiting for. Minoru Suzuki versus John Moxley. And it was a war, to put it lightly. It was exactly what you expect out of Mox. And Suzuki, I mean, the, the guy, he, you talk about can't miss. That is Minoru Suzuki. Cannot miss. Also, it was kind of cool because, you know, in every Minoru Suzuki match, Hammer knows this better than me. He's been watching New Japan longer than I have. There is a guaranteed forearm versus forearm off. And Minoru likes to, uh, it's kind of cool what he does because he has a really short forearm and he hits you quickly and he will normally sell his opponent's forearms big to kind of give them the impression like this guy's tough, kind of, sort of. Well, here's the deal with this. He always laughs at you. You know, if you forearm Suzuki really hard, he kind of laughs in your face. Like, is that all you got? Mox is the guy who laughed back. That didn't happen before, and it was a really cool visual to see Mox laughing in Suzuki's face, eating forearms from him. And there was the one table spot that was, you know, where Mox put Suzuki through a table and Suzuki laughed about it. You know, it was it was just these two guys proving how absolutely crazy they truly were. I gave it a 9 out of 10 as well. Go back and watch it. It was great. Moxley retained, and people are going, wait, really? Yeah. Look, Suzuki is not a man for title reigns. He never has been. And this is also for the IWGP United States Heavyweight Championship, which is more or less the Gaijin title, effectively. So Mox still has it, which keeps feeding the rumors that AEW and New Japan are going to work together officially, while I have seen rumor killers out there that they are not. Yet Mox is holding one of New Japan's championships. So anyway, it was it was awesome. It was everything that you wanted it to be and more. And then after the match, oh God, you talk about something something that made me mad. After the match, Zack Saber Jr. decides to attack Moxley. And he takes his belt and he holds it. So it looks like Zack Saber Jr. is next in line to face John Moxley. And I really hope John just kills him i i just i i can't do it was actually i can't I, i'll never deny the man's talent he's an amazing professional wrestler it's just he just doesn't get over with me i don't know what it is him and finn balor i will happily tell you how great finn balor is in the ring he'll just never get over with me personally even now with the heel stuff he's doing i just i can't i don't buy it then we had our main event where the duel IWGP heavyweight and intercontinental champion Tetsuya Naito took on Kenta in uh, I gave it an eight and a half out of ten it was a very good match but it had a very old school vibe to it it, it, w- it was sort of a slow down deliberate pace they told a pretty decent story throughout it Naito getting busted open on the turnbuckle was a very nice touch uh, it, it was it was a good match and Naito retained his title it was cool And then after he won, Kenta walked away all disappointed and dejected and, you know. But one of the things that I thought was cool is Kenta came out with the entire Bullet Club and Red Shoes kicked them all out out from ringside. That was pretty cool before the match even started. Now, of course, later in the match, a couple guys from Bullet Club came back into the match and tried to disrupt things and Hiromu Takahashi came and saved Naito during the match. So that was kind of cool. And then after the match was over, Naito wins. He's got his two belts. He calls out Hiromu Takahashi as his next challenger. Now, remember, they're both members of LIJ, but in New Japan, this is in no way a weird thing, okay? If you're a WWE fan and you ever saw two guys from the same faction go against each other voluntarily, you would think the world is about to end. In New Japan, it is a very regular occurrence. It is just, hey, man, I know we're on the same team, but out of respect, you're the best. I got to fight you to prove I'm this good. And it happens all the time. It's also a tradition 
that at the upcoming event, I the title of it escapes me. But I believe it's a tradition that the heavyweight champion faces the junior heavyweight champion at this event, and it's cool they're keeping that going. And it's just a fantastic added bonus that the heavyweight champ happens to be Naito, and the junior heavyweight champ happens to be Hiromu Takahashi. So those two are going to be awesome. It was kind of a cool little promo. They went back and forth. They said yes in Spanish because you know L.I.J., and it was fun. So, but the the main event I gave an eight and a half out of ten. It was a pretty good match. But overall, it was an awesome event. I highly recommend it. That is New Beginning in Osaka on February 9th. If you got your New Japan World, please give it a shot. It's uh, it, it it was it was very well done. It was awesome, and all the events leading up to it were a lot of fun as well. I have to say. But I'm also wondering if a reemergence of Bullet Club is potentially in the cards because. Because they haven't really been winning everything. It's just for the past five or six months, they were losing everything. And now it looks like they're not anymore. And that really makes me curious if they're going to make them a bigger part of things. I'm, I'm, I'm very curious about that myself. So let me remind you guys about who helps us out here. Pro-Am Belts. We've been working with them for a long time. Check out their website, ProAmBelts.com. Follow them on Twitter, at ProAmBelts. We have a promo code you can use with them. It's TBT15OFF. That's TBT15OFF for 15% off your next purchase from ProAm Belts. The most impressive thing about them is their turnaround. You will get the belt in record time. They have an as-seen-on-TV category on their website. You can get any belt you've seen on TV. They will make one for you. That is ProAm Belts. Use our promo code TBT15OFF for 15% off your next purchase from them. Also, check out Manscaped. For those of you on the video, as you've noticed, the entire bottom half of my beard is mostly gone. Thanks to Manscaped and the new lawnmower 3.0 that came out recently. They were nice enough to send one to all of us here at Turnbuckle Topics. And we can save you some money with them. Use our promo code TURNBUCKLE on Man- at manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping on your next order. That's promo code TURNBUCKLE at manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping on your next order. Check out Fight TV for us. If you don't have New Japan World, you can watch New Japan on Fight TV. You can watch AEW on Fight TV. You can watch any wrestling that is not WWE on Fight TV. They have deals with everybody. If you like kickboxing, Fight TV. If you like boxing, Fight TV. If you like MMA, non-UFC, Fight TV. They have a deal with everybody. It's a cheap subscription. I'm a subscriber myself. And make sure every once in a while you check out the Turnbuckle Topics Twitter. That's TT underscore for you, Y-O-U, because we're always doing deals with them. We get promo codes, whether it's the group or our individual podcast, whether it's myself, Champions Advantage, the Bearded Wrestling Podcast, or the Rundown. We're always doing giveaways for Fight TV. So go ahead and sign up. It is definitely worth your time and money. When I come back, I'm going to tell you about ROH Free Enterprise and how that one went over. Also, I have plans to discuss NXT TakeOver Portland with you guys because this is my last chance to make a preview and picks on it before it goes live. Stick around. It's going to be fun. Every Monday night from 6 to 7, it's the top of the rope wrestling show on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Now, once again, here's the enforcer, Gil Kuda Jr. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Top of the Rope Wrestling Radio. Talked about New Japan now. We're going to get into Ring of Honor. They did their free enterprise show yesterday out of UMBC Event Center right here in Baltimore. And the reason why it was called Free Enterprise is because it was, in fact, a free show. You, you had to request tickets online because they still had to assign you a seat. But nevertheless, it was a free show. And I'm just going to kind of go down the docket here. First, we had uh, Mark Haskins defeat Alex Shelley in a one-on-one match. Seven out of ten. Did the job. Nothing real spectacular there. Then uh, Vincent and Bateman defeated uh, Joe Henry and Dalton Castle again. Seven out of ten. Nothing really crazy. Then Flip Gordon took on someone making their Ring of Honor debut. He goes he goes by Slex, S L E X, and Flip got the win on him. So you know you're always going to be a big star when you debut and you lose. So uh, seven and a half out of ten to them. A couple extra spots there. Flip always puts on a good show. Then Alex Zane took on Andrew Everett. Zane got the better of him. Seven out of ten. Nothing crazy. 
Then uh, the Briscoes took on Flamita and Bandito in an awesome tag match. Eight out of ten. Always a good show between those two, uh, especially when the Briscoes are involved. And Flamita and Bandito certainly did their part. And I, I feel like Ring of Honor might be kind of missing the boat just a little bit on Bandito. That dude is over in Ring of Honor. Bandito is over as can be. I feel like they need, he needs a little more. You know, we'll put a belt on him or something. I mean, it's he's over. Then, in what my in my opinion was the best match of the night, which was a battle royal to determine who got a shot at the world championship in Ring of Honor. And there were some surprise showings, like Hammer, you'll like hearing this. The Blue Meanie was there, as well as Gangrel showed up, which was kind of crazy. The vampire himself. And then WCW talent uh, Crowbar was there, although he's kind of been in and out of Ring of Honor recently. And then my personal favorite, Maria Manic, was in the Battle Royal. Good for her. Uh, Dan Housen and all his Twitter fame. The Beer City Bruiser, Brian Malonis, the Bouncers were in it. Silas Young, Josh the Goods Woods, Delirious was there, Hot Sauce Tracy Williams, Rhett Titus, uh, personal friend of the show, Kenny K-I-N-G King, Dak Draper, Brian Johnson was there, uh, Eli Isom, Cheeseburger, because what is a battle royal without Cheeseburger in Ring of Honor? And then uh, LSG was there and PJ Black, of course. And then Dragon Lee was in it, and everyone was going, but wait a minute, he was in New Japan. Well, Dragon Lee won the whole thing, and then he took his mask off, and it turned out it was Flip Gordon the whole time. So <laughs> Flip Gordon pulled the wool over everyone's eyes and won the whole battle royal for a shot at the ROH world title, which, of course, is being held by fellow member of Villain Enterprises, PCO, also friend of the show. And <laughs> just the, it's basically the ROH roster at this point are all becoming friends of the show. Then uh, Session Moth Marina beat Sumi Sakai, 7 out of 10. Good match. Did its job. Then uh, our guest from last week, Dan Moff, teamed up with Jeff Cobb, and they defeated Jay Lethal and Jonathan Gresham in a non-title match. They call it a Proving Grounds match. So it looks like, uh, oh no, it doesn't look like it. Jeff, Jeff Cobb and Dan Moff are going to get their tag team title shot against Jay Lethal and the Octopus in the future. Eight out of 10 match. Fun to watch. Jay Lethal never disappoints. Then we had Brody King take on uh, Ray Horace. He got the win there. 7 out of 10, nothing spectacular. And then in the main event, Marty Skrull teamed up with ROH World Champion PCO to defeat the NWA World Heavyweight Champion Nick Aldis, who teamed up with Roosh. And that was an 8 out of 10 match. They certainly stepped it up a little bit. So uh, final synopsis on this show. It was certainly a solid event. I highly recommend that you go and watch it. However, at the same time, I got to be honest, I kind of see why they gave it away. So it was a good show. I don't want to totally down it like, yeah, I go, it was free. But at the same time, I, I, you see, I want to know what the move was here. Because this was on the books for a while. And I think it was when ROH's crowds were just at a point, just, I mean, it was very sparse in every arena and they wanted to do a little something to get everything back. And then the Marty deal happened to coincide and it looks like it's on the, on the way up. So I'm going to take a second here and talk about what I believe is the current state of ring of honor. And I say under Marty Skrull. No, it's not because Marty is not running the company. Joe Coff is running the company, but Marty is now the lead booker. He's got all the stroke around there. So, it looks like he's going to make deals with a lot of his buddies in other companies to bring in some talent. You know, he already got Jay White, and he's going to fight him at Supercard of Honor in April. But it looks like April is the start of all of this. It looks like that's when it's all going to start to take off. So my question is, what do you do in the meantime? Because you have other events. I'm curious. And I think there are some guys that are still getting passed over that shouldn't get passed over. For example, who did Flip Gordon, dressed as Dragon Lee, eliminate last in the Royal Rumble for a shot? He eliminated Kenny King. That upset me. Kenny King should have gotten a world title shot at least a year ago, if not sooner. Now, granted, he's part of, you know, La Faction, and he's trying to... All right, cool. So, he's in a good spot. And I think Ring of Honor is okay, because you see guys re-upping. No, granted, there are some of the traditional re-ups. You know, hey, Silas Young re-upped. I'm not shocked. The Briscoes re-upped. Wow. You know, okay, fine. But you see some other guys. You see new talent getting brought in, which I think is a very encouraging thing. I think Ring of Honor is going to be fine. 
I think Ring of Honor is going to be okay. I don't think they're going to go under. I think Marty's going to give a lot of ideas. I think he's going to go very fan first in a lot of aspects. But here's one thing I want Marty to do. I don't want him to forget what a big talent he is. Because I feel like that's what's going on in AEW to some degree. You know, I mean, Cody's in a big deal right now. Sure, I'll talk about that later. But my example is actually Kenny Omega. Kenny. Kenny, you're so much better than what you're in, man. Look, I know he's won half of the tag team champions in AEW. All right, fine. But he's, no. You're you're a singles megastar. Like, let's be real here. So I, I don't want Marty to forget what kind of star he is. Don't be like, hey, I'm the boss, so I can't book myself big. Sure you can. If you're that big of a star, absolutely. And he should. Because Marty should have been ROH world champion. Probably all the way back at the MSG show last year. So I, I don't know. I think they're okay. I think they'll be all right. Free Enterprise was an interesting first step. Love the Battle Royal. All right, now I get to make picks on matches, which is always fun. NXT TakeOver Portland, which is on February 16th, where uh, every title in NXT <laughs> is uh, on the line, I believe, uh, at least in, in NXT uh, Winter Park, as I call it. I've noticed a lot of people call it NXT North America. Because, you know, there's NXT UK. So I, I, I don't know. I like to call it Winter Park. So first, we have the only match that does not have a stipulation or a championship involved. And that is Finn Balor versus Johnny Gargano. The promo these guys cut last week, it just reestablished to me how good Johnny Gargano is at what he does. He is, it's very hard, in my opinion, to play the role of the aggressive babyface. I feel like that's a tough spot to be in, and he's in it. Now, Finn is doing the heel thing, a lot more classic, is a lot more Prince Devitt than he is Finn Balor. Okay, fine. But in this match, I think Finn gets the win here because, let's be real, does Johnny need to win this match? No. He's Johnny Wrestling. He's Johnny NXT. He's Johnny TakeOver. He's Johnny whatever you want to attach. He doesn't need this win. Johnny's going to be fine. He's NXT for life. He's a permanent face of that company. He's don't you dare send me to Raw. He's that guy. Finn Balor, he needs this. Because if Finn loses this after his big heel transformation and he's won a couple matches and all this, he got his shot at the, you know, he got his shot at Adam Cole and he couldn't pull it off, all that. I don't, he needs it. If Finn loses this match, then what did you even turn him for? That We're back to square one. Okay. So Finn needs it, so I think Finn gets the win. Then we're going to have a street fight between two ladies where the former best friends, Dakota Kai and Tegan Knox go at each other in a street fight. This is going to be nasty. I have a feeling. I have a feeling this is going to be a rough match. I do. And... I believe that Dakota Kai is going to get the win because I think it just makes more sense. I mean, look, you can try the tug on the heartstrings angle all you want. Tegan Knox is the baby face and she was wronged and injured. And yes, all of that fits perfectly. But it would just be so much more satisfying just to see Dakota Kai standing over her holding a chair, just smiling like, yeah, I finally put her down. Like, I feel like that's a better look. Plus, it gives Dakota Kai an incredible launching pad to go after the NXT championship or something. It just give her a giant push in that direction because we need another main event level female on NXT. Ray is the champion. Shayna can always be plugged in. Bianca Belair is going to be an NXT champion one day, a hundred percent. But other than that, I really don't know. So I think they need somebody else up there. So I think I think that's a good way to go about it. Then we have the NXT Tag Team Championships, where Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish of the Undisputed Era, or as me and Hammer like to call them, Red Dragon. I, well, a lot of people call them that, actually. But still, they're going to take on the Broserweights, Pete Dunne and Matt Riddle, who won the Dusty Classic for the tag team titles. Now, my first question is because Keith Lee took the North American title off of Roddy Strong. Will the collapse of Undisputed Era continue? That is my question. Because if it does, it means they're setting up for something big because it is mania season. Remember, 
It's mania season. What better time to split up Undisputed Era than mania season? I'm just saying. So it could happen. And honestly, I think it will. I'm going to pick Dunn and Riddle to win the belts because they're a very unlikely team. But if you really look at the situation, okay, it looks like Pete is full-time in NXT Winter Park right now. It doesn't look like he's going to be ferrying back between here and the UK. So if that's the case, and you don't want to throw him at Adam Cole just yet, and you don't want to throw Riddle at Adam Cole just yet, then what do you do with them? They work as a team. You put them together. Give them a good run. Of course it's not going to last. We all know they're going to split. They're destined for huge single success. But why not put the belts on them for a while? See what happens. So I think Dunn and Riddle win the titles. But the more important part than what I've just mentioned is the collapse of Undisputed Era continues. And I think they're setting up for something really big in that. Then we have the North American Championship where Keith Lee is going to take on Dominic Dijakovic for his newly won title. Uh, Keith is going to retain that one. I'm very confident in that. But here's what I like about this match. These two guys had an incredible feud on NXT. They fought each other three weeks in a row. Great high-quality matches. Two big guys that move like they weigh 150 pounds apiece. Incredible stuff to watch. And when it all happened and Keith looked like he was getting his title push, Dominic said, hey, man, when you, if you win that thing, I should be the first one because of our past. And not only did it happen, and not only did they mention it, but it's actually happening that way. And it's very rare that that happens in WWE. So I'm glad that they stuck with it. That was a very good call. Even though Dominic had to win a shot at the title and he shouldn't have had to win it, still, I'm glad that they stuck with it. So Keith Lee and Dominic, they're going to do well, but I think Keith retains. Then we have the Women's Championship where Rhea Ripley takes on Bianca Belair in a very interesting storyline twist because last Wednesday, Charlotte Flair showed up. Oh, no. And they basically tried to overlook Bianca Belair, and now it's Bianca's job to make sure she doesn't get overlooked. So my question is, do they have Bianca win the title just to throw everything off for a second or not? I personally do not think that that happens. I think Rhea Ripley retains, but at the same time, I'm very curious about it. Uh, I I like how they involved Charlotte and she didn't dominate the NXT promo. She kind of just got beat up. (laughs) Charlotte, it's just, no, this is not your turf anymore. It was kind of a cool way to put it. And then, of course, the NXT championship, Adam Cole versus Tommaso Ciampa as Ciampa goes after Goldie to bring her home. You know what? I think Cole retains because Adam Cole needs to have the belt for the moment. Because you can't, I feel like Cole can keep the belt and the era can still start to collapse. But they can lose the other gold and that opens everything up. So I think uh, Cole retains. But those two are going to have an all-out war, man. It's going to be a fun one to watch. It's finally coming to fruition. So just to recap the picks real quick. Balor beats Gargano, Dakota Kai beats Tegan Knox. Dunn and Riddle become your new NXT Tag Team Champions. Keith Lee retains the North American title. Rhea Ripley m- maintains her NXT title. And Adam Cole retains his NXT Championship. So only one title change. Sorry my picks are not that exciting in that aspect. But nevertheless, only one title change there. Let me remind you guys about Pro-Am belts. They have a great turnaround You'll get the belt in record time. Normally, when you order belts from places, it takes six weeks, eight weeks, whatever. No, we're talking half that, possibly less. Great turnaround from Pro-Am Belts. Use our promo code TBT15OFF to save 15% on your next purchase from them. Check out ProAmBelts.com. Follow them on Twitter, at ProAmBelts. Use our promo code TBT15OFF for 15% off your next purchase from them. Check out Manscaped.com for me. I don't know if you heard, but in 2020... Beards are out, clean shaven is in. I did not personally get that memo. Neither did Hammer. Neither did a lot of people I know. But nevertheless, when you're ready to make that change, go to manscaped.com, get their new trimmer, the Lawnmower 3.0. That thing is fantastic. I can attest to it personally. And use our promo code TURNBUCKLE to save 20% off and free shipping on your next order. That's TURNBUCKLE for 20% off. And free shipping on your next order at manscaped.com. And make sure you go sign up for Fight TV. It's a cheap subscription. You get all the wrestling in the world that you could want that is not under the WWE banner. And you can get all the MMA in the world that you want that is not under the UFC banner. Kickboxing, boxing, you name it. And when I say all wrestling, I don't just mean all the independents. I mean AEW, New Japan, the NWA, Ring of Honor, all of it. 
for a cheap monthly fee, go check them out. That's Fight TV. We're glad to be working with them. When I return, we talk about 10 lashes that were given to Cody on AEW Dynamite, not to mention a certain legend has come back and what we might see on Raw this evening. Stick around. It's going to be fun. Every Monday night from 6 to 7, it's the top of the rope wrestling show on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Now, once again, here's the enforcer, Kill Kuda Jr. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. So, last Wednesday on AEW Dynamite, they ended the show with the American Nightmare Cody fulfilling his stipulation to MJF to get a match with MJF. And one of the three stipulations, one of them is that Cody cannot touch MJF until the event. The second is Cody has to have a cage match against MJF's second, who they keep referring to as Mr. Mayhem Wardlow in a, uh, he has to have a cage match against him. And the third stipulation is what was carried out, which is Cody had to take 10 lashes with a leather strap from MJF. Now it was just a belt MJF made Cody take his belt off because MJF said, my belt is too nice to use for this. Okay, fine. It, I'm glad I watched this when I did. I'm glad I had to catch up on this because the live reaction to this was one of three. One was, it was a good segment. It got them both over. MJF is continuing to prove what a great heel he is. Cody sold it like an absolute champ. They had, you know, Dustin come out and Arn Anderson come out and the Young Bucks come out to kind of power Cody on. And then all the heels came out and stood at the top of the ramp to watch Cody get whipped and have fun with it and all this. And it was, you know, okay. The other reaction was, this is ridiculous. It's a little bit too hokey. Why are we going this far? And the last reaction was, and I'm so glad I can say this as bluntly as I can, this very small portion of the AEW universe acting like Cody made some godly sacrifice for all of us. It was just the most amazing thing. They were like, isn't this painful to watch? I'm like... And again, this is what this is why I said I'm glad I watched it when I did. When I watched it live, I don't know if I would have reacted differently. I just would have been like, that's really what you think? Like, I mean, look, it was a good segment. It went over very well. Okay. The only way they mixed it up is out of the 10 lashes that he took, Wardlow gave Cody one of them. And that one was about as powerful as the other nine that MJF gave him put together. That was a nice switch up. But other than that, it was just kind of Cody doing a great sell job, effectively, and MJF being the heel that he is. And I mean, you know, they had everybody come out. They made it a really big deal. Okay, fine. So I, you know, if I had to rate it, I'd give it an 8 out of 10. Yeah, it was good. They did well. But it wasn't some earth-shattering segment. It wasn't, it wasn't all that anybody wanted, you know. All right. It's what I expected. I thought it would be more than what I expected. It wasn't. It, it would, you know, he got whipped 10 times. All right. That's it. See, here's my problem with it. Cody wants to be this face of the company that everyone admires. Then why is the way that you're getting a match with the number one heel laying down and giving him whatever he wants? That's my issue with it. Like, that's, first of all, that is the most in my opinion, young American thing to do. Hey, I really want something. Well, this guy says I have to give him a whole bunch of stuff to get it. Okay, well, I'll give it to him. No. No. I, I, I'm sorry, but I, I don't buy that. I, I understand what they're going for, the sacrifice angle, all this stuff. If Cody gets the absolute – if he gets the heck beat out of him against Wardlow in a cage, fine, that works too. But I just, I don't understand it. I I don't, it it doesn't make sense to me because Cody, you know, I understand, you know, hey, I'll do whatever it takes to get a match with you. But then there's just no pride after that. 
I think that's what bugs me. There's no, I don't buy the American nightmare character having zero pride because right now that's what it is. He has no pride. I'll do whatever I can for a match. Oh, you want to whip me 10 times? Okay. Oh, you want to put me in a steel cage with your gigantic assistant that can rip me in half? Okay. You want to make a stipulation where I can't touch you until the match? Okay. Here's everything you want, Mr. Friedman. Can I have my match now, please, even though I'm an executive vice president? Like, come on. I, I'm sorry. It's a little bit much. Just a tad. I see what they're going for. I'm not saying it's bad entertainment because it is good entertainment, but I see what they're going for. Also, just for the sake of nitpicking, this main eventing a show, do, do you know what it was? It was a very WWE thing to do to have a non-match segment main event a show. Now, I know that's not the first time AEW has done it, but I don't know. It was good, okay. Then another one, uh, another thing that happened in WWE world is Goldberg came back and he challenged The Fiend for his Universal Championship. They're going to face off at the Super Showdown in Saudi Arabia on February 27th. There are rumors that Goldberg is actually going to take the title off of him to set up something at WrestleMania. I do not believe said rumors. I just don't. There is... The Fiend won the title at one of these. I don't think he's going to lose it. The Fiend is recklessly over in Saudi Arabia. I I don't see that happening. It'll be fun. See, that's the thing. Somebody asked me, uh, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll call them out because you should go listen to them. Uh, it was one of the, the ladies from Those Wrestling Girls. They put up a tweet and they said, hey, is anybody looking forward to this? And I said, the feud is more enticing than the match to me. I'm waiting for the buildup of The Fiend and Goldberg messing with each other. Okay? The match at Super Showdown, I don't expect anything special. That, it's going to be eight minutes max, right? I, n- nothing big is going to happen there. But the buildup to it is cool. And if The Fiend wins, I mean, let's just think about that in strict wrestling terms. Hammer knows this better than I do. The Fiend beating Goldberg, you talk about a feather in your cap. That is massive. Especially at a show that, granted, it isn't considered that over here. But at a show that is effectively a WrestleMania-level show in Saudi Arabia. That's a big deal. We don't consider it that because 90% of fans think the Saudi show is stupid and they shouldn't do it. But in strict wrestling terms, that's what it is. So I, I don't know. Now, my other question about title feuds, especially on SmackDown, is the women's situation. Because they had a fatal four-way to determine the number one contender for Bailey's title on Friday. And it was between Dana Brooke, Alexa Bliss, Naomi, and Carmella. And Carmella won to get a shot at Bailey. And she pinned Naomi to do it. Now, that's what bugged me, that she pinned Naomi to do it. That's what bugged me. But Naomi is the pick. Clearly, she returns. Everybody wants to see something different. She is undoubtedly something different. Carmella has barely been on TV. Dana Brooke has barely been on TV. Well, recently more than usual, but still. And then Alexa Bliss... I mean, yeah, I guess you could always put her in that type of... She's one of those safe-type options, but nah, I don't know. I don't know. And then tonight on Raw, we get the massive eight-man tag match, Kevin Owens and Samoa Joe with the Viking Raiders against uh, Seth, Seth Rollins and all of his crew. Becky Lynch and Asuka are going at it for the Raw Women's Championship. And will we hear from Ruby Riot, who has returned, and why she attacked Liv Morgan? We're not sure. We don't know. But time will tell. So my recommendations to you are go and watch New Beginning in Osaka if you haven't. Get ready for NXT TakeOver Portland on the 16th. And don't look down on this Goldberg and Fiend stuff too much, please. All right. Guys, that is it for me. Hammer, thank you for driving the boat. It's been a fun weekend of wrestling. Hopefully this week we'll live up to it as well. Remember, we got a TakeOver coming up on Sunday. That'll be a lot of fun. I'll have to try to fit that one in. Me being someone who's going to watch Daytona as well on the same day. So that'll be interesting. But that's it for me, you guys. I'm out of here. Take it easy.